Welcome back to Coding Shorts. My name is Sean Wildermuth. Today's Coding Short isn't that short. In fact, my wife talked me out of calling it Coding Almost Short. I'm running a little long for what I wanted this series to be, but I thought this was an important topic. Over the next few videos, I'm going to be talking about ASP.NET Core middleware. This is an important topic. Really understanding how middleware works, where you would use it, and how the order of the middleware matters is something that's really important to me. In today's episode, I'm going to be talking about what middleware is, how it works, and how to write your own middleware. Let's get started. So before we dig into how to write your own middleware, let's talk a little bit about how the middleware actually works. So if you've ever created a brand new ASP.NET Core project, you'll see that middleware is being registered. You might be familiar with static files, routing authorization, maybe you're mapping controllers, maybe you're mapping razor pages. Each one of these is actually a piece of middleware. And when I talk about middleware, I just mean it has some code to run. So if we start out and we want to go to some page on our project, what actually happens? ASP.NET Core starts the scope for the process and then starts to call the middleware by calling the first piece of middleware. And in that case, it's going to come in and it's going to look at whether this is a static file or not. If it can't, because it, this is a, an URL to an individual page, it then calls the next piece of middleware. It may be doing some things that are trying to fulfill the request or it's just adding some context to that request, which is the way that routing and authorization work. So they're always going to pass it to the next piece. Finally, when we get to map controllers, it's going to look at all the routes it has in this route table, and it's not going to recognize this URL. So it's going to go, I can't handle it either. Let me call the next. And finally, we're down here in Razor Pages, and it does know about this. But if it didn't know about it, it would also say, you know what? No one could fulfill it, therefore, it's going to end up being a status code 404, right? But in our case, some page is an actual razor page that it can map to. And so it fulfills the request by filling in the response. And then it just returns, which takes it back to map controllers, authorization, routing, static files. And finally, after static files returns, it goes ahead and sends that content to the user. What's important to uh, realize here is that each of these pieces of middleware doesn't know about each other. It just knows that it can call the next person in the chain. That's it. And it has an opportunity before it calls the next piece of middleware to do some work and to do some work after the call to the next piece of middleware returns. So we look at something like an API, we have that same process. The request comes in, static file says, nope, not me add some context, add some context. Map controllers goes, oh, I know this route. I can call the controller to fulfill the request. And it does, and then it returns. And notice because map controllers could handle it, Razor Pages middleware was never called. And that's intentional. The same way if we do have a static file, that static file request comes in, static files says, oh, I know that file. Let me return it, fills the request fills the response and the returns without any of the rest of the middleware being called. And this is an important idea here because you can't guarantee that your piece of middleware is being called, but also that the order matters. One of the reasons that static files is first is that when you start to think about how a typical web page works, there are more static files than any request into Razor Pages or controllers, right? You have images, you have CSS, you have JavaScript, all these individual files that are being returned. Let's look at some code. So I'm back in Visual Studio, and I'm gonna open up program.cs because I'm using .NET 6 in this case. But this should be similar if you're using an older version, and what I'm gonna talk about is the same across most versions of ASP.NET Core. So you can see those familiar pieces of middleware that we were sort of alluding at that are being called one after another. And so every time one of these uses is being called, a piece of middleware is being registered for it. So one way to add middleware is actually just to call use itself. Use is saying, I wanna inject myself into this chain. 
and I have some very little work to do. So we're going to start here. In our case, we're going to say it's asynchronous, and we're going to expect two pieces of data being passed to us. Context, which is the HTTP context, and next, which is a function that calls the next person in line. And so this next becomes pretty important because this is how my middleware will know how to call the next one. I'm not going to know who that is. I'm not going to know if the programmer changed the order of this or any of that. I'm just going to know when I'm done with the job I need to do, I need to then call next, invoke, and pass in context. Because this is just a function underneath the covers, you could just call next with parameters. And that's the way it was done in older versions. But it's recommended now that we pass the context in uh, because it results in fewer allocations. But we want to actually do some work here. So I'm going to start by creating a start that just has a starting date value. More importantly, a time value. And what I'm going to do with that information is I'm going to actually call app logger dot log information, and I'm going to tell it how long this request took to be fulfilled. So again, I'm able to do stuff before I call next, and I'm able to do stuff after next executes. So this next is going to call the next piece of middleware, who are going to call the next piece of middleware all the way down the line until someone can fulfill the request. I don't need to know any of that information. So I'll say request duration in milliseconds. And how am I going to get that? I'm going to say date time UTC now. So what time is it right now? And I'm going to subtract that start. That's going to give us a time span so I can just call total milliseconds. I have all the information I might want in that context. So I could say request context.request.path so that I can see the request path as well as how long it took, right? And this is now a complete set of middleware. Now it's not packaged in the way we might want to, but it is a complete successful piece of middleware. Let's run this real quick. We can see our piece of middleware didn't interrupt any of the things that normally happen with this project. But if we come over to the console, we can see that a request for root did what? It fulfilled it and it took a second and a half and probably took a second and a half because some things were warming up in the startup of these pieces of middleware. The second request, which was what? Testing.styles.css, a static file, took less than a half a millisecond, right? A tiny amount of time because all it was doing was returning one piece of item. And so we have middleware that's actually doing something. Let's close this. Back in Visual Studio, let's talk about another kind of middleware. And in this case, we're not going to make it asynchronous because what we will actually want to do is say return test completed task. And I'll use that app.logger again to log information saying terminating the request, right? Where what's important here is instead of calling next, I may have done some logic here where I can say, you know what, I'm not calling the next person, so just return a completed task. Of course, it's complaining here because the way we're using it as a Lambda here, it can't really figure out which overload we're trying to use. So we have to give it a couple of hints. So this is going to be an HTTP context, and this is going to be actually a func that returns a task. Now, because we're doing it this way, now it's perfectly happy. And let's run that project again knowing that this piece of middleware is going to call this piece of middleware. Notice the web page doesn't come up. If we look at the console again, so I wish we could look, wish we could zoom that a little better for you. It says the request for root took five seconds or five milliseconds, and it took so little because all we did was terminate the request, right? We didn't do anything but return with a failure here. So there are times when you want to be able to build middleware that is going to be what they call a terminating middleware, where it just doesn't call the next. Or in most cases, you're going to want to just call the next like we do here. But this isn't packaged very usefully or being able to reuse it. And it doesn't really feel like the use authorization or map razor pages. And more importantly, it also doesn't have the services either. So first, 
Let's go ahead and build a new piece of middleware in a more appropriate way. So I'm just going to create a new file and I'll call it timing middleware. Doesn't matter what you call it. So in this public class, I'm actually can get rid of that uh, one indention with the namespace. I love .NET 6 and C Sharp 10 because of that. So I'm gonna cr first create a public constructor that takes a couple of pieces. And what I'm gonna expect is timing middleware is going to have a logger just like you might be used to. And because of the, we're gonna use this as middleware, it actually also fulfills a request for a request delegate. What is the request delegate? It's actually the next call, right? It's where we're in the Lambda, we were using next when we actually called it, we're using this when we create this piece of middleware to assign what the next piece is. And so here I'll just make some fields to hold my data. And then the real magic happens in a call that looks a lot like what we saw in the Lambda, but isn't in the Lambda, right? And here we're gonna call invoke and expect a context. We're only expecting a context in this case because the next delegate was passed into the constructor for us. And here we can come back to program.cs and just copy some of this code. So first of all, I'm gonna, gonna comment out our terminating middleware because boo hiss, right? And here I'm just going to copy what we're doing here. I'll leave it here so you can see what it looks like in case you wanna get the example. But we're gonna do the same thing we did before, except we're gonna get this from the past and next delegate as well as the logger, right? We're not doing anything different here that we did before, just we're doing it in this more formalized class. And this is useful because this class may be reused because it's going to be injected into the service collection for us. And so if this is transient, we're gonna get a new one every time. If it's scoped, you actually have to change this a little to deal with scope. And that's important if you're using other types of dependencies that need to be scoped. Uh, DB context is a pretty common one you'll see there, but I'm not gonna cover that part. What I'm gonna do here instead, say app use middleware, and I'm just gonna point it at our timing middleware. Now we've commented out these, so it really should be calling these. And I'll just put timing instead of request so you can believe that uh, we're getting this from our new piece of middleware, not the old one. So let's run it again. Same thing happened, our app works fine. And we can see timing, timing instead of request, right? Same things we were looking at before, but it's not coming from that piece of middleware. And we can also see that the description of where it comes from is also that timing middleware. Let's close this. And if you're in an organization or you wanna share this across projects, this works. Like you don't need to do a whole lot of magic here, it just works. But if you wanna look and feel like other pieces of middleware or you're sharing it in an open source project, that sort of thing, there's some niceties that you can make it a little better. And so back in our middleware, I'm gonna actually create a second class I'll call timing extensions and I'll make this a static class because we're gonna want these to be static. And this is gonna return an application builder. Move this up so it's a little easier for you guys to see. And it's just gonna say use timing. And this is gonna be an extension of the I application builder. So just an extension method here that takes the app and calls use middleware timing middleware, right? Just like we did manually, though there might be uh, some other operations here that we're gonna care about. And let me just return that. And so that allows you to take our use middleware and make it a little cleaner and also allow it to pass in data if it needs to by calling it use timing. We now look and feel like the others. Now in our case, our middleware is pretty thin in what it needs to do, but you may need things. Let's imagine that we had something like, like an I timing object that we were gonna to use to do the timings. Maybe we weren't gonna write all the code here, but we wanted people to be able to supply their own. So we could do something like this, of course. I'm gonna delete this because we don't need that. That does indicate that we might want a second call here, right? Public static I service collection, static void, add timing. 
and this is extension method. And what am I going to extend? I service collection so that I can do services dot add transient I timing some timing, right? So this gives you that opportunity to register those services. And in fact, when we look at something like add razor pages, most of what it does in here is just add all the services that razor pages needs. And so that when we call map razor pages later, it doesn't fail to find those services. That's why there's always been a pair of those. It's just middleware. And so I'm going to comment this out because we're not going to actually use it, but you can see that the pattern for creating most middleware is creating these two extension methods, as well as implementing a piece of middleware. And notice there is no interface for this. Middleware, because it can be created in so many different ways so that you can decide how you want to integrate it, it just has to have a constructor that accepts the next request delegate. So that's a requirement of it, as well as follows this pattern of invoke with the HTTP context. It's not doing this via making sure that we have that interface. The interface could be useful for this part, but there'd be no way to guarantee this part because constructors aren't part of interfaces, right? And so don't be thrown by that. This is just conventional middleware, not contracted middleware like you would have with an interface. Hope this has helped you understand some middleware. This is going to be the first of a multi-part series where I talk about a bunch of the built-in middleware that a lot of people aren't using to really show you that you can get some other benefits by using the middleware. This was a way for us to show how you can write your own, but then we're going to follow it up with a few more of these coding short videos talking about that middleware. Again, if you've gotten this far, hopefully you've enjoyed it. Go ahead and like and subscribe. I guess that's what us YouTube people are supposed to tell you to do. Either you do it or you don't, but uh, it always helps. Please feel free to you know share this with your friends and coworkers. That always helps us as well. And I'm Sean Wildermuth, and thanks for joining me for another coding short.